Hey everyone, and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Austin Wynn. I'm a third year medical student located in Chicago, Illinois. I make helpful videos about the field of medicine. So wherever you are on this journey, hope that this can be helpful to you. As I go across my third year of medical school, I'll be making more videos specific to kind of what I'm going through, so shelf exams and clinical rotations, but I hope the videos throughout my channel I've posted in the past can help you if you're a pre-med or you're a first or second year medical student. So my channel is all about making helpful study tips, Anki advice, kind of helping all of you know things that I wish I knew when I was at that part of my medical journey. And hopefully as I get further along, I can keep making helpful videos for all of you uh, along the way. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. I appreciate it very much. So thank you all for joining the team, the family, and uh, continue to subscribe, like this video if it's helpful to you. So today we're going to be talking about the internal medicine rotation because I just finished this and I want to help all of you get an outstanding or to honor this rotation. So let's get started today. Alright everyone, so it's time to talk about the internal medicine rotation. So talking to a lot of other medical students just from what I've heard on Reddit and to other people I've spoken to, I would say internal medicine is probably one of the hardest rotations you'll go through in medical school. Between internal medicine and surgery, I would say those are the most difficult ones because A, it's very time intensive in the clinic and B, there's quite a bit of studying that has to be done just by looking at like UWorld questions, there's about 1,200 internal medicine questions, which is almost double all the other rotations. So you can see that there's quite a bit to do both in the hospital and out of the hospital, which makes it one of the most time consuming and therefore one of the most difficult rotations. So I'm hoping this video can help all of you uh, to not be too worried about it and to go in with confidence and ultimately to do well on your internal medicine rotation. So let's start with the first two components that go into the the grading system of honoring your internal medicine rotation. So again, this might be slightly different depending on different medical schools, but largely there will be two components to your grade, and that's your clinical grade and your NBME grade, which is the shelf exam you take at the end of your eight week rotation. So let's start with the more objective one because this is a national level exam, the NBME shelf exam for internal medicine. So this is an exam that's taken across the country through NBME software or whatever, and there's not too much information that I can really say about it, but I can tell you how I prepared for it, and based on my test taking strategies and what I saw when I took the exam, hope this can be helpful for you when you prepare for your exam and your rotation. So at University of Illinois, our NBMEs was only one third of our overall grade, and the clinical rotation was two thirds of our grade, which is based on evaluations you get from your residents, interns, and your attending, and the staff of team that you work with. So let's start with the NBME. So the NBME is 110 questions. It varies, it's mostly multiple choice. There's also some fill in the blank questions. That, uh, that kind of caught me off guard. I didn't expect to see that. Um, so be prepared for those as well. Uh, in terms of preparation, all I did personally was the 1200 UWorld questions, and I also did Anki flashcards for internal medicine specifically. So if you're not sure what I'm talking about when I say Anki flashcards or the UWorld questions, I recommend you watch this video up here. It's basically how I'm studying for all my shelf exams through using Anki, which is a space repetition program to retain all the information, and then using UWorld to practice, which are just basically a bank of practice questions. So that's all I'm doing to study. I think even though it might not get me the very highest scores in the shelf exam, I'm hoping it gets me a good enough score along with strong clinical evaluation scores to get me that outstanding and honoring grade. Um, so overall, I would say Anki is great because it not only helps you on your shelf exam, but it's spaced repetition, so it's gonna help you longitudinally. And ultimately, I wanna do very well on step two CK. And for many of you watching, uh, step one may already be pass fail by now. So step two CK becomes the important exam, the make or break it exam. So you wanna really get into good studying skills, good strategies, and things like Anki to really help you excel on your shelf exams and your step two CK exam that would be coming up after you finish your third year and your clinical rotations and shelf exams. 
So for the NBME portion, basically all I was doing was trying to do about 40 questions a day when I was in the hospital and then doing um, Anki flashcards every day and slowly unlocking the flashcards and learning more information as I went on. As I got incorrect questions wrong on the UWorld question bank, I would either make a new flashcard or search up the flashcard in my deck to find if there was a card on there already and then unsuspend it and start to learn it. So in terms of studying, I was really just doing those two things. I know that people talk about different books like case files and step up to medicine. And if you find that, you know, reading out of a textbook and learning through that type of method is better for you, then absolutely go for it. You know, for me, I just didn't have much time to read out of a textbook and I get bored very easily. I don't learn as well if I'm not interacting with the material because then I just get sleepy and I don't really pay attention. So flashcards are more interactive for me. You can do it when you're on transit, when you're, you know, walking to different places or getting groceries, that kind of stuff. So uh, I think that that has been something that helped me in my first two years of medical school as well, helped me to do very well in step one. So I'm just kind of continuing with that. That and then doing questions. Anyways, if you're interested in seeing how a day of internal medicine looked like, I did a vlog of an entire shift. I actually did one of my call days, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., and I posted it, so I'll be linking that up here. So check it out to kind of see how the general workflow of the internal medicine day looks like. All right, so now on to the more exciting part, less studying and test taking. It's the clinical evaluation portion. And as I mentioned before, for me, that was two thirds of my grade, so much more of weight than the NBME. So I spent a lot more time in the hospitals, learning and trying to see as much as possible. So in your clinical rotations, uh, there's a lot of crossover between the NBME as well because you'll learn and see so much. And you know, I've noticed that when you see someone that has like liver cirrhosis or you see a clinical condition pan out in the hospital and you treat that patient directly, a lot of the pathophysiology and the information sticks a lot better in your head because you know you have this visual real life you know component to help support it as well so don't take your clinical evaluation and rotation time lightly i know a lot of students sometimes feel like oh i'm in the hospital 10 to 12 hours a day there's no time to study like it's a waste of time i'm not doing anything you know i think it's up to you like you can decide how much you learn and how much you do by being proactive and just being you know helpful to the residents and the interns so i mean that's my first advice is just being open and willing to learn and just kind of letting the residents and interns know like first thing first day on the job like you know i always tell them my job is to make your job easier the residents are very busy and the interns as well they're just starting something new and if you're not aware the interns are just the first year residents but anyways they're very busy and just doing the little things to really help them they notice that and it helps you kind of get involved in the teamwork environment it helps you you know sort of help facilitate patient care and then ultimately i think that translates to strong clinical evaluation grades because it shows that you are very willing to help willing to learn and you sort of help everyone you know treat patients and have the whole um, system workflow go much smoother so uh, some of those little things i'm mentioning is like being willing to call families and letting them know like what's going on with the patient a lot of times the physicians are really busy and they don't have time to call the patient it's really basic you know you see the patient in the morning when you pre-round you talk to the team you sort of know what's going on what the care is and you kind of just call the family and be like hey you know your son is being here treated at the university of illinois wanted to let you know he's doing well today we're kind of getting him on you know loop diuretics to kind of help with his congestive heart failure getting the fluid build up out of his system He's breathing better, the shortness of breath is doing great. Just wanted to let you know, and if you have any questions or concerns, just let us know. You know, something simple like that, you know, it helps the team, it also helps with patient care, just lets the family know what's going on. So that's one thing you can do. Um, another really easy thing you can do is just getting to the hospital a little earlier than everyone else and printing out the patient list for them. So if people start coming in at 7 a.m., maybe just come at 6.55 and print out the list and have it on everyone's computer so they don't have to print it out themselves. Um, little things like that, even if you feel like you're not doing much, you know, these little things really do help the team overall. Uh, another thing you can do is call consults. Um, this might vary depending on what hospital you're at and what program you're at because sometimes the residents or the interns don't want you calling the consults, but if, you know, you earn that you know, trust from them and they, you know, trust you to do that, that's another thing you can do. That's something that I did a lot on my rotation. Um, basically calling a consult is like after you see a patient and you notice that, oh, this patient has very bad, you know, kidney function. Maybe we need to talk to the nephrology team and get them on board. So then you call nephrology as a consult and just let them know what's going on. Like, hey, this is a 45-year-old female. 
uh, with signs of end-stage renal disease may need to start dialysis. We just wanted to give you the information. We're caring for her medically. We wanted to get you guys on board uh, in case you wanted to do dialysis or any further workup on the patient. You know, simple things like that. So a lot of different things will come up during the day that you can be helpful and just let the team know, hey, I can do this if it's helpful or, you know, is there anything I can do to help right now? Uh, something that I found to be really helpful to the team is what they told me during their feedback is that I would always sort of have Epic open on my computer and this is Epic, it's just an electronic medical record. Most hospitals in the country are moving towards Epic, but some might not have it. But in Epic, there's like a chat feature and a lot of times the nurses will chat the team about a patient. Sometimes the doctors are so busy, they don't see the chats right away. So if you feel comfortable, you can respond to those chats and help you know alleviate some of the workload from everyone else. And don't feel like you have to just do this on your own. You can always check with the resident, just be like, hey, um, the nurse for a patient in room 385 said they're wondering if this patient could be on a diet because it says that they're NPO. And then the doctor would be like, oh, this patient could be on a diet. And you're like, hey, uh, this patient can eat. Sorry for not changing that right away. And they can put that in. Um, so in addition to all of that, you're going to be doing notes probably for the patients as well. So just learning the style that your specific resident and attending likes their notes written, that's another thing you can do to help with your evaluation grades. So I mean overall, no one is going to be very good at any rotation the first day they step in. You know, It's just part of learning. I think the biggest thing that sets you apart from someone who might not get as high as a clinical evaluation score is number one. Everyone can make a mistake, but just don't make a mistake twice. You know, if you need to learn how to write a note better, when they tell you something, just make sure you do it from that point on going forward so you don't have to repeat um, learning something over and over because, you know, they sort of pick up on those things. It wastes their time, makes everything slower. So, you know, if they say they want things done in a certain way, like they want their problem list in a systems-based way or something like that, it's going to be different for every resident. So don't just be like, oh, well, my other rotation person likes it this way. You know, you just change the way you do it. Just listen to what they say and do your very best and always be hardworking and open to learn, you know, things that you all probably already know. So, I mean, that's kind of my advice generally for how to approach this rotation. Finally, and just a couple of things I want to say about your presentation, because a lot of times you work a lot with the residents and the interns, but not as much with the attending until you, you're rounding with the attending. So when you're rounding with the attending, before you go and see every patient, a lot of times you have like a table round where you present the patient to the attending, especially if it's a new patient that just came in the night before, the morning of, and the attending has no idea who it is. So you have to give a full history about the patient. And a lot of times their grading and evaluation is based on how you present the patient cases. Like, are you confident? Do you know what you're talking about? Do you have all the information? And do you really know what's going on? So did you thoroughly do like a chart review and have all the information in front of you? So that's kind of a lot of where the pimping comes from because a lot of the you know attendings would be like, okay, what's the hemoglobin when the patient came in? Or what do you think it is? What's on your differential? Like they're just gonna ask you these questions about the patient you already knew about like two hours ago. So it's your job to kind of come up with everything and think through all the different scenarios and have all the numbers in front of you so you're prepared for any question the attending might ask. So kind of going back to that hemoglobin on admission question I said, um, this kind of goes into one of my major points is that when you're presenting your labs, always present it in trends. No one cares that the hemoglobin was 11 today. Tell us the hemoglobin was nine on admission and now it's 11, it's trending upward. Like talk about trends and that's just not with hemoglobin, that's with all the labs you present. Anything that's significant, make sure you say if it's significant because it went down or went up and then let them know what's going on. You know, in addition to um, what we're talking about in terms of labs, I would recommend just not saying all the labs either. I mean, as a medical student, you sometimes feel like, oh, I have to say everything, but no one wants to go through a laundry list of a CBC or BMP and where you say every single thing. If it's all normal, you can say like, CBC was largely unremarkable outside of a hemoglobin that was low at 9.4 and then kind of go in a cohesive manner and kind of paint a picture so your attending knows what's going on. You don't want to get lost in all the numbers and the facts that the attending ends up not even knowing what's going on. So my final point of advice on the presentation is to have a logical, linear presentation, do it the same way every time, and be open to feedback because even if you do it this way, you're attending specifically, your resident might say, we don't like it that way, do it this way. Just listen to them, don't listen to me, I'm not grading you. But my recommendation is to have a very succinct and you know set way of presentation that you'll do every time. So I'm gonna quickly go through that now as we wrap up this video. 
So if it's a patient that you've been following and the attending already knows who it is, it's just like a brief checkup, you just do a SOAP note, which is subjective, objective, assessment, and plan. S-O-A-P. So for the SOAP note, it's really quick. It's like, this is our 45-year-old male that presented for a congestive heart failure exacerbation. Subjective, this is how the patient was doing. Uh, no acute events overnight. I talked to the patient this morning. No additional concerns, X, Y, Z. O, objective state you know the vitals state physical exam findings state any recent imaging or pertinent labs those are all objective findings then finally your assessment and plan uh, what are we going to do for this patient so today we're continuing to monitor patient is getting late 6 40 milligrams bid we're continuing to monitor ins and outs we want a net fluid status of like negative 1 to 1.5 liters per day and then what you're going to do for chronic conditions continue home medications etc whatever you're going to do and that's it so very succinct and in the same order every time if it's a new patient what we like to do is do kind of a full history and physical presentation so the full h and p so basically it's like okay so this patient is 45 year old male with significant past medical history of xyz presenting for this a uh, brief ed course patient came into the emergency room because he started feeling short of breath um, the patient had this this and that he got this done in the ed basically all this stuff was done, work up, and then he was admitted to us on the medicine floor for this reason. Uh, social history is this, family history is this, past medical history is this, like all the stuff that goes into the whole general history, you kind of present it like that. And then you go into like what you're gonna do for the day. So then I examined the patient this morning. This is what I saw objectively. This is what was seen on physical exam, the vital signs, labs, imaging, and then our assessment plan. So the really only difference between a SOAP note and HMP is to kind of give more of a background story because this is the first time the attending has heard about the patient. So, so overall, you know, these are my little tips and tricks for the internal medicine rotation. You have your NBME exam and then your clinical rotation portion. So if you can just master these two sections or depending on how your school grades, focus more on one section or another, I think that'll give you the best chances of honoring or getting that outstanding on your internal medicine rotation. Hope this is helpful for all of you. Feel free to comment below with any questions or concerns. Check out my other videos about internal medicine or study strategies. And don't forget to subscribe and like this video if it's helpful to all of you. Wishing you all the best. I'm currently wrapping up my neurology rotation. So more information on that. And then I'm off to surgery after that. So uh, have a great rest of your week. And thanks for tuning in.